If you've ever scrolled through social media, you may have come across the hashtag Black Excellence. The phrase emerged out of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and it's now a term used to amplify and celebrate the achievements of black people. It gained prominence during the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020. School programs are named after it. But, question, does black excellence encourage black people to sacrifice their mental health for the sake of societal expectations? Can the term do more harm than good? To discuss, we've assembled a group of excellent black individuals, starting with Nathan Andrews, associate professor in the Department of Political Science at McMaster University in Hamilton. He joins us on the line from Vancouver, BC. In the nation's capital, Gerald Grant, principal investigator and co-lead of the Black Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub and professor of information systems at the Sprott School of Business at Carleton University. And with us here in the studio, Cheryl Thompson, associate professor in the School of Performance at Toronto Metropolitan University, and Tracy Moore, host at City TV here in Toronto. And it's great to welcome you two here to our studio and to our friends in Points Beyond. Thanks for joining us tonight here on TVO. Tracy, you first. You do not hear people use the expression white excellence, <laughs> but apparently black excellence is a thing. Sure is. How come? Well, can we just start with the definition? I, I looked up a definition, and this is it. Black excellence is the embodiment of resilience through trauma, confrontation of adversity, and perseverance through struggles, while consistently pushing the boundaries of progress to achieve our goals. Who wants to do that? <laughs> as soon as I read that, that sounds to me so exhausting. And Doc, you know this experience, and I know this experience, and I'm sure the, prof the, the professors on the line know the experience as well. Black excellence was something I think that was coined to uplift. And it has, in many ways, become a bit of a prison. It's exhausting to think that you have to look at our experience from a gaze from outside of our community. We need to actually put ourselves in front of this idea of excellence. I'm into black mediocrity. I want to be able to just live, basic, basic get human. up, go to work, pay my taxes, and not be penalized for that. Okay, hold that thought. Yeah. We're gonna get back to black mediocrity, but first, more on black excellence. Do you relate to this? I completely relate to it, and I think, to your point, if you think about the 1960s, you needed something to aspire to, right? Like black excellence is aspirational mm -hmm. and that's great. But my question is, it doesn't, my statement rather, it doesn't leave room for mistakes. So now the black person has to be perfect in everything that they do. One little mistake, it's like you're personally flawed. You didn't make a mistake, something's actually wrong with you because you're not excellent. Whereas I look around at colleagues who are not black and they could be average. They're allowed to be, you They're say. allowed to be Society average. lets them that be. That is perfectly, or they could be great, or they could be poor. <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? They could be the range of experiences. With us, we're held to such a standard that after a while, it really does feel like a prison hmm. that you're in. Nathan, how do you weigh in on this? So my perspective is similar, actually. Um, and I, I also think that there is the need for the celebration of excellence, right? So because black, especially in academia, black people have often been underrepresented. Um, their contributions have not been celebrated well enough. So I think that sort of concept or hashtag helps to celebrate those contributions and to highlight that, oh, these people are also contributing. But then the problem is that we live, the problem is the system that we live in that makes it worth bringing up such hashtags, right? Because ideally, we should be in a system where every contribution is celebrated. If people don't want to achieve anything at all, that should, should also be fine. But we live in a system where whiteness is the mainstream. And in such a system, white excellence is sort of this considered to be the status quo. So for a black people is expected, a, a black person is expected to, to do way more and to stand out and to be extraordinary, right? So it's a sort of the notion of black exceptionalism that mm. my, my, my colleagues have spoken to, that makes it problematic. And it really conceals systemic barriers and pressures that we all face and sort of places us in a very unique position. And at the same time, it multiplies the institutional and societal expectations of black people that we need to do more. Look at this person, he's achieved all that. You can also do it. And then we forget about the systemic problems that would prevent 
every black person or most black people from achieving those specific goals. Gerald, let me get your take on this notion of black excellence. What do you think? Well, uh, being excellent is a good thing, right? <laughs> being excellent at your work and your craft is something that is good. But this idea, this exceptional idea of being of black excellence, I think, as my colleagues have said, is problematic in, in many ways. Um, it can be psychologically damaging uh, to people because I've seen black uh, young people, especially, who find that you know they might not have achieved the, the the level that they're looking for, or that expectations that are on them to achieve, they feel like they have not done anything, uh, that they're not good enough uh, when they're doing really excellent work. If we were to take it, um, you know, like everybody else. So I think um, I definitely feel that we need to be excellent in what we do to um, be our best selves. Uh, but uh, this expectation of being exceptional um, to just gain half, to be twice as good for half the rewards, as, it, as the saying goes, is not something that we should um, push too far. Now, as we continue our conversation, we also know how tough it is to get around this capital city of ours. So let me welcome Mitzi Hunter, uh, who has just arrived. She's the president and CEO at the Canadian Women's Foundation. You know her, of course, as a former Ontario cabinet minister and I believe a board member here at TVO once upon Six a time. Six years. Six years here. Okay, Mitzi, great to see you again. Weigh in on this, if you, if you would, from the standpoint of, of the following. I wonder if the lack of comfort I'm hearing around this literal and metaphorical table about black excellence is because, is because there's somehow a view out there that it's so rare we have to put a label on it. Do you feel that from time to time? Not at this stage. When I think of black excellence, I think about who is it for? And oftentimes it's really an aspirational notion that is put out there. And it does recognize that it's challenging. It's challenging to exist in society, to be a woman, to be a black woman, to be a black boy, a black man, because there are impressions that are put upon us that may not reflect the reality of who we are. Put upon you by whom? Society. Everybody there are, else. There are biases. I mean, many of them are well documented. Um, just look at policing. You know, it's it was recognized and reported. Anytime you look at disaggregated data of any kind, health, education, employment, whatever statistic, prison records, anything, you recognize that there are biases in the society mm -hmm. that are disproportionately affecting people. And so the notion of black excellence is a counter to that. And, you know, I think of young people and, uh, you know, making sure that they feel that they can live and exist in existence in society and to live up to their full potential and to exist without barrier. Hmm. Does part, Tracy, does part of your unhappiness or off taking offense at this term uh, relate to the thing I just mentioned in, in that there's this sense that black excellence is not commonplace enough in our society and therefore we have to call it something and name it so that one can take pride. Uh, I think from our perspective, I understand where the notion came from. We are not recognized in the wider society and our achievements aren't recognized and our inventors and our scientists and our doctors and our history and our legacies aren't recognized. So I understand where the notion of black excellence came from and I'm sure it came from inside our community. Am I right? Yeah. So right. if it comes from inside of our community, it is something that was supposed to be aspirational as both of you have mentioned and something that's supposed to make us feel a sense of pride. You need the self-esteem, you need the pride in order for us to be able to go forward in life. But I think what it's become now is it's become something that feels almost like it is from the white gaze looking at us. And if, if that is the situation, then we need out. 
Save it. We need out. What I'm saying is we need to come up with our own notions of what we feel are success, and they are not necessarily going to be Serena Williams and Simone Biles. I should be able to get through life and achieve whatever I want to achieve or not much at all <laughs> and still be respected as an individual and not be harassed in the streets and be able to stand in the mall and maybe not spend any money without being chased out by a security right. guard. Like, we have to be able to move through life like other people can move through life. Well, that relates to excellence versus exceptionalism. Exactly. And that's what I was going to say. The reality is black people are excellent. <laughs> Take any field, right? You can see excellence at, in any field, any age, right? That's the, not the problem. Really, black excellence for me is like a code for black exceptionalism. Mm. So they take the exception, and now they want to hold that person and say, this is the standard that now we're going to sort of measure every black person up against. Or conversely, they say, uh, you're, it's because you're so exceptional why you got here. So you're like a different black person, mm. <laughs> right? Like, how did you do this as a black person? You're so exceptional. And it's mm. like, well, I went to public school. <laughs> I had black parents and black friends. I did the same things that everyone else did, just like my white colleagues who are exceptional. Mm. So this is where it gets into that tricky difference between excellence and exceptionalism. I want to be excellent. I don't want to be exceptional. Mm. I don't want to be this outlier. And I feel sometimes, especially in academia, the, the black person who wins awards and is always, their name is everywhere, they, they become this unicorn. Mm -hmm. They have no peer group. They have no one to talk to. They are literally marooned in their exceptionalism. And, and I don't think that's excellent because every black person, in my opinion, if we're going to thrive, if you take that, that original definition from the 1960s, mm. why did it come out of the 1960s? Because there was so much collectivism. There was black community organizing, and they thought of themselves as a whole, and everything was moving in unison. Now, in my opinion, there is so much individualism that they want to pluck out the one black mm. person yeah. and just see them as an individual, not as a community. Let me get Nathan to follow up in this regard, and we're going to peel back the curtain of academia a bit here and find out about mm. academic tokenism. How do you see it? What do you mm. think of it? Well, so that, that is a quintessential aspect of black excellence. Because, I mean, the idea of being a black icon um, which, you know, my colleague was referring to. It's like, you, you are the exceptional case in a department. Um, and for me, I'm a, I'm a beneficiary of a cohort hire at McMaster, black cohort hire. So I can speak to that later on. But I just want to say that that was a time where, like, I entered the, the, the institution, I entered the department, and then I felt like I was the only black professor. And so that way you are, well, in that department, not the whole school, of course, but it, you, you are the person that they go to for certain types of things. So you are the person they go to if they want to have a black face or they have some initiatives going on and they want to show diversity, you are the person they will call, they, they will call upon. That feels tokenistic, right, um, in, in a way. And, and that, that really adds to the pressure that you experience as an academic because, I mean, on top of all the work you have to do as an academic, public, go to conference, teach you're not you're not going to get a teaching reduction because you are doing all these things as a token as a black token but they still expect you to and they expect you to do it at an, on a very exceptional or at, at a very excellent level and that becomes problematic if, if there's a chance for me to just share a little bit of my experience so in my own case i grew up in ghana um i had my higher education in ghana until my early 20s before i came to canada so everything around me everything i was aspiring to um, was black. Everyone that I saw that I wanted to, so I wanted to be a pro person was a black person. So it wasn't really an exceptional case. I came to Canada and I noticed it is really exceptional in a way because if you look at academia, even though you have you know, high school people at that level, there's lots of black people, lots of people from all races. When they go up to the you know university level and beyond that to PhD, the, the number reduces. And I think that's where this idea of excellence comes from because like the number has reduced how come these people were able to make it through, you know, all the, the struggles and all the, the, the hindrances that would prevent people from getting there, right? So, and that's why when you get to that point, you become a token because you are seen to have thrived. And like a definition that was, was shared earlier on, you have made it through this whole um, system that would typically prevent you from, from getting that far. But that, that the notion of tokenism is a problem and it, ha it causes a lot of mental health issues for for people that are in, in these positions. Let me follow up with Gerald then. How should black excellence be 
reframed or reconsidered to make it more palatable? Well, I don't know if we want to make black excellence more palatable in the sense that we've been talking about it. Um, you know, when I when I started out, when I went to school and to be where I am, I didn't think about this notion of black excellence in the in that in the sense that we've been discussing it. I thought about it as a way as trying to achieve what I wanted to be as a person, as a you know for myself. Um, I wanted to be an academic. Um, to to live the life of an academic just like everybody else who are academics. I didn't go there to be a black academic <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah. I wanted to to be at one of the best schools in the world, and and that's what I did. And I think of myself that way. The challenge is though, is that you are made a token by those who are uh, who are looking on because. Of many experiences I've had, you know, going to different schools or so on, you're not given the same opportunities. Um, you're always, um, what should I say, the structures, the institutions that are around in academia are not there to help you to get along just like everybody else. And you have to be be treat, you're treated really as the exception. Uh, one thing I'd like to say is that this is an issue that is relevant to here. Just this last week, I was in the Caribbean at a conference of excellent black people talking about AI, and I I didn't this whole notion of of exceptionalism was not there. We were a whole bunch of people in the space talking about artificial intelligence and its impact on the South. And it was just such an excellent feeling. It was it was such a, a great place to be without feeling like you're a token. I would say that excellence is built in community. And I think um, someone referenced that already mm -hmm. with the mentoring and, and all, all around support. And I think that's what we need to start looking more to, you know, building networks that will uplift our excellent work. I want to take Can I just add to sure. that just quickly because I think one of the things you have to understand in terms of the if we're talking about academia, mm. I mean it starts in grad school, right? Like when you if you're a black PhD student in Canada, you're probably the only one in that program. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe there's someone else but they're doing something different. So you're you're already kind of set up to feel a little tokenized. The moment you enter grad, undergrad is different, right? And I, I'm just a quick story. I remember when I, I have a PhD from McGill University. That's not bad. That's not bad. <laughs> when I walked that graduation stage, the crowd gasped. <laughs> Come on. There was a noticeable <laughs> gasp Come on. because there were so many graduates and I was the only black one. <laughs> and they were just shocked. Like, I think it was just a complete shock. Like, McGill is producing this? because they'd never seen it before. I was the only PhD. What year was that? That was 2015. That's not that long ago. That's not that long oh ago. Gosh, okay. okay, and I, I was the only one. So I I'm think gasping. that's part of the, the hmm. issue too. I want to take Mitzi Hunter down memory lane here for a little yeah. bit. And that is, when you were at the cabinet table in Kathleen Wynne's government, were you the only black face at the table? Yes, I was the only, well, no, no. I wasn't the only black face at the cabinet table because right. Michael Coteau was my Michael colleague. Michael was there as well. I was the only okay. black woman. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm not surprised at, at the experience that you've had because if you go back to um, universities in this country, yeah. at one point there weren't accepting black students in programs in medicine and mm -hmm. law. That's right. And, and that's why we, we now have the Scarborough Charter, which uh, 54 universities and colleges have signed on to, to correct those wrongs of the past mm -hmm. and to, to even the playing field because it was so uneven. My follow-up question for you was, and, and I'm gonna date myself a bit here, but I do remember covering Alvin Curling swearing in as the first <laughs> black cabinet minister in Ontario history mm -hmm. almost 40 years ago. And I remember talking to him years later, and he said, I had a headache every day I showed up for work in the first year that I was a cabinet minister because I felt so much pressure not to disappoint the members of my broader community. And I'm wondering whether you felt that same thing 
at the cabinet table that pressure to be excellent? I didn't because Alvin Curling had been there, Marianne Chambers, Margaret Best. Um, you know, I grew up in Scarborough. Sanana Conde. Conde. I grew up in Scarborough, mm -hmm. uh, where I saw Alvin Curling, Dr. Alvin Curling. I, you know, met with Dr. Jean Augustine. I had the opportunity to really touch those um, incredible role models, and that's why I hold the premise that you know, what are we talking about Black excellence for? I believe it is for that generation that is coming up because they need to see it to. Be be it, mm -hmm. and it's a very important concept. Um, our history that is real has created uneven playing fields. I'm sure you know that Leonard Braithwaite was the person first, who called out Etobicoke, um, exactly black the, the discrimination built into the education system and saying that we don't need segregated laws on our books mm -hmm. because that is the history of education in Ontario. And so there is a reason why we have to hold these new archetypes <laughs> and create new realities and aspirations. And yes, it is exhausting and it's <laughs> it's a it's a it's a weight that we carry, but there's a reason because there's a future generation that is looking to us. Tracy, you're one of the oh sorry, you wanted I to say something. I was actually going Please, to yes. say I felt all the pressure. I felt it every single day from this the minute I walked in to start hosting City Line. It was prevalent, it was in front of me, it was in my head, it was almost debilitating. I had to intentionally shut it off every day because I was the only black presence in that room. None of the camera crews, none of the producers, none of the audience, it was me. And I felt my community, the hope they had put in me to carry out this role. I really did not feel there was any room for error. Now, did that come from outside or inside? Both. 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 I mean, I am raised by hardworking Jamaican immigrants. You know, the, my dad took one sick day, and I think it was before I was born in 1975. Hmm. So as a mechanical engineer, he went to work every day. My mom as well, 30 plus years working uh, in hospitals. And so the work ethic is, it's in there. And there is no such thing as not showing up. And so for me, that's the internal struggle I had. But externally, I felt like I had to represent. Like, this was a very big deal for people to be doing lifestyle television. And you did. I did. <laughs> you but, did. I, but the barriers Tracy, I had did. to deal with, for yes. sure, I did it, I did it, yes. honey. And I'm so happy yes. I did it. And, it. and I'm very proud of my record. But I don't want my kids to feel that amount of pressure while they are going through life. I think it is a beautiful thing when you can sit back and have the space to rest, to daydream, to really think about where you want to spend your time and energy on this planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm -hmm. that, to me, is the true wealth. That, to me, is true excellence. That, to me, is you have arrived mm -hmm. when you have the opportunity to sit back and really imagine and dream what you would like your reality to be like, rather than having this pressure internally and externally to constantly be at the top. Let me put that to Cheryl. When you got yeah, that hallelujah. gasp, <laughs> when you went up on stage, Stage yes, to get yes. your degree and you got that gasp. Yes. I wonder if there was a part of you that thought, I'm going to show these folks. Did you feel that pressure? No, there was a part of me like, oh my goodness, get me off this stage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm surrounded by a white audience. Like I just felt so, but you have to understand, I had spent five years in a program where I knew I was the only black person. They just saw that for the first time <laughs> and had that reaction. I had to live in that existence. And so for me, you know, I feel so much of what you're saying, because as a black academic, sometimes it does feel like that. You know, there's so much pressure to always be um, sort of black and intellectual mm -hmm. and always be this thing. And, and the reality is, is that I always remind my black students, remember, you're human first. Mm -hmm. So just lean into that. Like, you have the same insecurities, problems, challenges as everyone else sitting but, in the room. But the dean of the law school, at your university is a black woman, right? You're not by yourself anymore. 
Oh, oh no, 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 come on. No, no, no. <laughs> we can't, we can't. Well, I mean, I don't know that person. We've never met. I mean, and that's just one person in a completely different field. And so what I'm saying to you is I'm talking about people that are in your network. And like, who's in your network? Are people going to know you? People mm. that you, you went through the process with. For example, I have white colleagues. They went to grad school just like me. Mm. They are still friends with those people they went to grad school with because they're like a cohort together. And you are not. I just have me. <laughs> yeah. Right? Okay. Like I, and I have the new colleagues that I met. And so I've, and I've built my own networks. I'm not, this is not a sob story. Mm -hmm. Like I've built my own networks. I'm only pointing out is that when you are the only one, and I think I'm speaking to a lot of people who understand this feeling, the only one bears a lot of pressure to be perfect. And you can internalize that need to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And then your whole life, ends up you know, not being very well, self-care, sleep, taking care of yourself, and realizing that you actually don't have to be perfect. If you get through the struggle, which I did, you will meet other people, yeah. and they will be able to relate to you, and you can grow. So that's really the, the positive spin to what I'm saying. Gerald, I see you trying to get in. No, I just wanted, you know, I, my first job uh, back in Canada was at McGill, teaching at the business school um, for, I stayed there for a year, and a lot of the issues that we're raising here might be connected to why I'm not there. But, um, you know, I was the only one, of course, in the whole faculty, so I know what it feels like. Uh, what I would say, though, is that what I've tried to do is to build networks, and I think, Cheryl, you started to talk about that is to build networks across the world. So I still have uh, a great cohort from my days at the London School of Economics. I still, in actual fact, we created a conference that we run every year with my colleagues who are not all, you know, they're not black necessarily, but some of them people of color from different parts of the world. And we deliberately focus on bringing uh, our conference to places like South Africa, like South America, to all of these places to build networks and to give people opportunity. And here in Canada, I'm now leading the Black Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub. One of the things that I've done, because I realized that I was not going to, there was no one to replace me when I retire in, in my business school per se, right, or in the community overall, in, in business schools across Canada. And therefore, in our programs, we have built in that graduate students, every pro project that we, that we fund must have a black graduate student or our undergraduate student as part of that process to build that cohort of people who can then come up through the ranks. Because if they're not there right now in undergrad, they won't be there 10 years from now. And, um, and, and so we have to start building that, that network. And that's what I've been trying to do all my life across, across academia, um, both here and, and you know, across the world where I have lots of um, activity going on. Let me get Mitzi Hunter to follow up on that. Well, I think the, I wanted to say the importance of disaggregated data is important in Canada. It's something that we don't have and we don't really measure. Um, the Prosperity Project put out uh, the Zero Scorecard report that looks at the corporate world and um, in terms of women and how, how women are progressing. And it turns out that it, when you look at black, indigenous women, it's less than a percentage, it's actually 0.8% of corporate leaders, um, board level, C-suite level that are black or that are indigenous. And and if you if we're not looking at, what one of the challenges in that uh, scorecard is that there's no pipeline. So there's no um, putting forward that next generation of managers, directors, and leaders that can take on those roles. And so unless we are measuring and tracking and really being intentional about promotion, then that does not happen. And it's not because the talent is not there, it's mm -hmm. because the talent needs to be sought out and there needs to be a space of belonging and inclusion at all stratas in order for people to, to feel that they are included. How do you fix that? Well, I mean, you can be intentional. 
uh, you know, just as uh, our professor rightly said, you can actually require it, uh, open space, have training, promotion and support. And, and and one of the things about our topic today about black excellence is, you know, society needs to accept that it is there, it exists. Mm -hmm. that people of all backgrounds are very talented and want to contribute. The opportunities to do so need to be created. Those doors need to be opened up. Uh, people need to be, in terms of where they're recruited from, sought out, given the opportunity, told about the opportunity so that they can compete fairly for it. But I think the question is, you know, is, is excellence something that you have to come innately, you know, it, inhabiting, or is it something that you can develop? Like what you're, what the pipeline is really that you're gonna develop the talent. And I think often black people, we're not given that room. It's like, you're not gonna be excellent when you just finished university. <laughs> you know, you just got, you just started. So there's things to learn, but I feel like that's where this thing has this grip where even at that young age, you have to aspire to a level that is, uh -huh. you know, someone's been working 10 years <laughs> to aspire to, and you're supposed to graduate and already be there. It's such an unrealistic bar. Double standard. Complete yeah. double standard. Hmm. You're someone who spends some time on social media, right, Tracy? Quite a bit. Okay. Yes. <laughs> do you ever do you ever on X use the hashtag Black Excellence? No, I don't think I ever do. Uh, first no. of all, I'm not on X. <laughs> I got off of that app. <laughs> that app does not work for me. But I would say on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook, no, I would never hashtag Black Excellence. And it's not because I'm not. I am excellent. We all are. You know, like I see excellence all the time. I see it in elementary school. I see it on sports fields. I see it at the gym. I see black excellence everywhere. My parents are my absolute idols, and it's not because they are Fortune 500 CEOs. It is be, it is the way they approach living and what they have brought to my sister and I, a sense of contentment and gratitude that I think is a beautiful thing to aspire to. But you see, the things I'm talking about they're difficult to quantify. And that's why black excellence to me, I have this, a, a bit of a pull and attention with. Um, so no, I don't hashtag anything black excellence. I'm a black woman in the world and I'm living. Nice. <laughs> that's what I am doing. I like that. I am living, I am loving, mm -hmm. I am enjoying, I am resting, I'm alive. That's it. That's all that's expected of me. Can I say, you sure are. You sure are. <laughs> right on. Steve. Right on. Na yeah. Nathan Andrews, can I get you to weigh in on that? That's funny. So I, I was going to make an initial point about how the way we're talking, I think some immigrant parents are probably sitting at home oh. saying, what are they talking about? Um, I mean, we, we want our kids to be excellent. We want them to win awards. We want them to, to be great and to be recognized by society because they've lived it and they know that, um, especially if you're a first generation academic, I grew up in a family. I'm the only um, person to have gotten a PhD um, in, in my family, even till date. So there's a lot of pressure on my shoulder. And, and you know, you, you, if you have immigrant grandparents, you know that they will push you to do that. The, the challenge, though, is that the pressure, the pressure is coming from internal and external. But then we don't, we celebrate excellence as an individualistic thing. I mean, that's what my colleagues have been saying so far. We should think of excellence as communal um, and begin to think about the communities that make these people excellent. And how do we recognize these communities that make these people excellent? So, I mean, if you think about community, you can begin to celebrate things such as black joy, black love, black hope, all of those. So, I mean, those can be hashtags. And I do use the black excellence hashtag occasion. <laughs> I used it just last week, actually, um, because I think it's important to, to keep it in context, to understand that, yes, if someone is excellent and they are also black, it needs to be celebrated, but that doesn't mean we should hold black people to a different threshold. One example, McMaster um, did this cohort hire and they have a program called Thrive. And the idea is to build a community for the new black scholars that have come into the institution, but I've been some of the people that exist there already. Yeah. Um, I think it's about 15 to 20 new scholars that they hired in the past um, two to three years. And that has been great because you get to be part of a community. You don't feel like an icon by yourself. You don't feel isolated, um, but you do feel like being part of a bigger community that is striving for change and transformation in academic spaces. So such a program is important and it's a way to build community, even though, if, even at the same time as we ex ex you know, celebrating you know, individual achievements. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, I wanna follow up with you on something that Mitzi said a little while ago, and that was, she said she didn't feel those pressure headaches at the cabinet table because there had been others that came before her. The notion of having role models 
How important is that to this conversation we're having? Well, first of all, I do hashtag black excellence. Oh, <laughs> you're do. allowed. You're Just allowed. Just putting it out there. <laughs> okay. Uh, role models are everything. I see myself as a role model. Mm -hmm. Of course. I went to McGill. I have a PhD. That's a big mm -hmm. deal. Do your students see you that way? Yes, they do. They do. They often do. And I, and I, and I take that seriously. And I want to... So for me, part of black excellence that I would love is mentorship. Like, I think mentorship is so important. It kind of speaks to what you're saying, right? It's like, that's how you build the pipeline. If you, you're like paying it forward. All of those old school things that, that my parents also brought me up thinking about is that if you succeed, then you're supposed to help other people succeed, right? And I, I, I fully believe in that. However, sometimes in academia, you know, it, it just happens. I mean, it's happened to me where you go to a conference and you've read someone's work, like, you know, they, they were so fundamental in your learning and then you meet them and you're like, oh. <laughs> so you have this like cringiness that maybe they're not who you thought they were kind of thing. So I always say to any young person who's looking for the role model, understand that they're also human and you can like their work and separate it from maybe the person that maybe you realize mm, they don't really, we're not the same type of person, but their work can stand up. And I think one of the things that I love about being an academic is that everything I do is legacy. Every article is really legacy, because when I'm gone, that article is still searchable. Yeah. When I write that book, that book will still be read. So I, I take that legacy mindset very seriously. That's why I, I am productive. That's why I am excellent. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about the, the adoration so much as 20 years from now, when there's a black student who doesn't know me, they don't even know who I am, they can still find my work and mm -hmm. engage with it. And I think, that's, to me, that's the community part that was mentioned. That's the mentorship. That's the excellence that takes it out of one person and thinks about like the generational mm. ways that you can build wealth. Because I also think that's wealth. Mm. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, less than two minutes to go, and I want to put this to Mitzi. Just as you had role models uh, to help you on your journey through Queens Park, you do understand that for young teenage black girls or you know young black girls in their 20s, you're their role model, right? Your experience at Queen's Park may help open a door for them at some point in the future. How does that feel to you? I, I welcome it. I, you know, I attended my um, high school 60th uh, anniversary um, at Winston Churchill Collegiate, which has the Leonard, Leonard Braithwaite program. Hmm. Uh, it's a black excellence school. This is in Scarborough. This is in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, went, I went to Cedar Bray, just putting it out there. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Does that make you enemies? No, no we're okay. friends. No, we're friends. Okay. We're our friends. girls. Totally, totally. Yeah. And um, it's, it's incredibly important that we show up for, for the younger generation. And um, what I love about our conversation today is just the diversity of of what I see as excellent voices in their professions, in the, their craft, what they do. And uh, what I want for the next generation is that they can grow up and see themselves without barrier or hindrance and choose their path. And, and that's really important that they see themselves as belonging in whatever part of society and that they're not excluded. And so, if that requires me to be out there and to put myself out there and to to break through barriers, you know, the first black woman to run to lead a party in Ontario or uh, the first black woman to be minister of education, I'm not going to be the last because uh, I know that others who look like me are just as capable of taking on these roles. Sometimes you, you just have to see someone else doing it um, to recognize your own potential. That line is really true, isn't it? If you can see it, you can be it. You can, mm -hmm. yeah. yes. That's a beautiful place to leave this discussion. Mr. Director, can I get a five shot of all our guests, please? I want to thank uh, Nathan Andrews from McMaster University, Gerald Grant from Carleton University, Mitzi Hunter, Canadian Women's Foundation, the former Ontario Minister of Education, Tracy Moore, City TV host, Cheryl Thompson, Toronto Metropolitan University. Great to have all of you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you.